Good morning, Doxa Church. It's great to be able to lead worship for you all. Please stand and let's worship together. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature you in the song that it sings all exclaiming indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing God all powerful Untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, You are amazing, God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun and give source to its light? Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing God all powerful untamable awestruck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing God Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name You are amazing God Incomparable unchangeable you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same you are amazing god you are amazing god amen of the earth from the depths of the sea from the heights of the heavens your name be praised from the hearts of the weak from the shouts of the strong from the lips of all people this song we raise, Lord, throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high. 
exalted in every nation, sovereign of all creation, Lord, most high be magnified from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the heights of the heavens. Your name be praised from the hearts of the weak, from the shouts of the strong, from the lips of all people. This song we raise, Lord, throughout the endless ages. You will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high, exalted in every nation, sovereign of all creation, Lord, most high, throughout the endless ages. You will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high, exalted in every nation, sovereign of all creation, Lord, most high, be magnified, be magnified. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this online worship service here at Doxa Church. We're so thankful that you're able to worship Jesus at home uh, with us, along with us as a church. Uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, uh, my name's Kyle. I'm the lead pastor here at Doxa, and I'm looking forward to someday meeting you. When this is all over and you feel comfortable coming back to a live worship service, I would love to meet you. So please plan on doing that. I have a couple of announcements I want to let you know about that are happening here at Doxa. Uh, the, big, the big date is March 20th. There are two things that are happening on March 20th. It's a Saturday coming up here in just a couple of Saturdays. Actually, it's coming up this Saturday. Uh, and we wanted to let you know uh, that on in the morning, uh, from 8 to 10 in the morning, Joshua's Men is kicking off again. And so uh, that's our men's ministry here. And Denny is going to be teaching the men through Hebrews. Now, some of you were part of that study last year when the world came to a halt and we stopped doing that ministry. If you were part of it then, please come back out. But if you weren't part of that then, you are still welcome to come out. We'd love to have you join the guys for that. They're going to do a little bit of a catch-up to where they are in the book. And it's a great time to meet some guys uh, to sharpen your understanding of God's Word. So join them for Joshua's Men, Saturday, March 20th at 8 a.m., and then also, later in that day, the Union is going to be gathering. Uh, the Union is our ministry for 20s and 30-somethings. Whether you're a young family or a couple or even a single, we'd love to have you come and join with that group of people. And they're going to be having a, a Seder meal to celebrate uh, Passover, to prepare for Easter, a, a Messianic Seder. Uh, so that should be a lot of fun. Dinner will be provided. So please join them for that. If you are coming, they would like an RSVP, just so you know how much food to get, and so you can actually RSVP Christian Ramirez at this email address and, uh, and let him know that you'll be there. Also, I want to let you know that on March 28th, following our service uh, on March 28th, uh, all the ladies of the church are invited to come to a baby shower for, for Katie Benninger. Uh, so that, that is something we'd hope you plan on. If you're able to come, if you're a part of that, we'd love to have you there. Um, you can get information for, for, for that ministry uh, from Christy Nash, and you can RSVP for that party at her email address here. Thank you to those who've who have given so much during this time, during this pandemic. We, we invite you to continue to be generous and to give to the ministry that's happening here at Doxa Church. You can go to our website, doxadetroit.org, and there you can go to the Giving tab and follow the instructions there to give. Would you pray with me? 
Father God, thank you for continuing to build up this ministry, uh, to send us into the community to do the work of spreading the gospel and making disciples and serving as ambassadors for Jesus. Would you take the gifts that are given this morning, would you use them for your glory? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand and let's worship together. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ. is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and i shall overcome yet not i but through christ in me Though fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. My sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains have released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race 
grace is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i but to christ in me yet not i but to christ in me yet not i but to christ in me I cling to the Lamb who has purchased me with His own blood. And I stand in His righteousness, washed by His mercy and love. Though I fail a thousand times, Lord, your mercies are new every morning. So wash over me, let my spirit be steadfast and strong. All my sins like scarlet will be white as snow Though they're red like crimson they will be as wool All my sins like scarlet will be white as snow Though they're red like crimson they will be as wool A broken and contrite heart you do not despise. So wash over me, clean my heart, clean my mind. All my sins like scarlet will be white as snow Though they're red like crimson they will be as wool All my sins like scarlet will be white as snow Though they're red like crimson they will be as wool Please be seated. Our first scripture reading for today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now this is the commandment, the statuses and the rules, that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your sons and your sons' sons, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I commanded you all the days of your life and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, had promised you, and the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. 
You shall write them on the doorsteps of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you, for the Lord your God is for the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from the face of the earth. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, as you tested him at Massa. You shall diligently keep his commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, and that you may go and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers by thrusting out all your enemies before you as the Lord has promised. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh, and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these things statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as we are this day and it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all the commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us our second scripture reading this morning comes from 1st John chapter 2 verses 1 through 6 my little children I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this, we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word... In him truly the Lord of the truly the love of God is perfected. By this we have known that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Sundar Singh, the famous early twentieth century missionary to India, uh, was once challenged for his lack of knowledge of the popular scientific theories of his day. Of course, the, since it was the early 20th century when he was doing his ministry in India, uh, the popular scientific ideas of that day were uh, mostly evolutionary theory. Uh, Sundar was asked uh, by these men what it was about science uh, that he was missing. And uh, as all good conversationalists do, uh, Sundar decided to question these guys. He dove in. He wanted to understand the critique that was coming at him. And so now I'm reading from his his collected works. Sundar asked, what is science? And they answered, natural selection and the survival of the fittest. Ah, Sundar replied, but I am more interested in divine selection and survival of the unfit. As we look One last time at the period of Jesus' life in which Jesus prepared for the ministry that God had for him, it strikes me that Jesus was interested in those same things. The story of Luke uh, 1 to 4 is the story of Jesus' divine selection. 
the, the, the birth narrative, everything leading up to this moment in Luke 4, has been a, uh, uh, a, a proclamation of the divine Son of God. At his baptism, there was a visual and audible announcement and pouring out of the Spirit to make very clear that Jesus is the beloved Son in whom the Father is well pleased. He doesn't become the Son of God at that moment in his baptism, but the information that was known only to a few people about who Jesus is was proclaimed to everyone as Jesus entered into this public ministry. And then the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to face temptation to sin from the devil himself. The point of this trial is to see if Jesus is fit, to see if he's, if he's the one. Can his heart and mind withstand the temptation that turned all of the hearts and minds of the men and women of God that came before him? Can he stand up where everybody who came before him failed? Will Jesus be just another flawed and failed leader, or will he endure and have victory precisely where we fail? As I reflected on Sundar Singh's words, I am more interested in the survival of the unfit. It dawned on me that this is exactly why Jesus faced temptation. He cared about the survival of the unfit. That's you and me. Everything he did on this earth, from, from enduring temptations to the, in the wilderness to, the, to suffering on the cross, everything that Jesus did, he did for us because we are unfit to survive any of it. With this in mind, we turn today to, to the last two temptations of Jesus. Well, last week we talked about the nature of temptation itself and how it, uh, it is distinct from sin. Uh, you can be tempted and not sin. That's really an important point. Don't get these two things uh, conflated together. You can be tempted and be without sin. The weapon against temptation, what will have you overcome temptation is the power of the Holy Spirit at work in you. It would be a mistake to read this passage for a list of things to do and strategies to stand up to temptation and not have the Holy Spirit. When you put your faith in Jesus, the same Holy Spirit that rested on Jesus when he went into the wilderness is now filling you. It is now at work in you. Without Christ and the indwelling power of the Spirit, there is no conquering sin. You won't do it on your own. We also looked at the first temptation. Uh, the devil sees that Jesus is hungry. He suggests to him, why don't you make some, some bread out of these stones? The temptation was for Jesus to admit that the Father had failed him. Basically, he's saying, make the food that the Father has not given you. Provide your own solution to your hunger. We face the same temptation every time we think we can give ourselves something better than what the Lord can provide for us. Every, every sin is actually a form of telling God that we know how life works better without him. We're going we're gonna to look at the other two temptations today, and you'll see that what they have in common with the first temptation is that they are God-oriented. Sins are all against God. Yes, we sin against each other, and by the way, that matters, okay? The way we hurt other people with our sin, that's, a, that's an incredibly important part of addressing the sins in our lives because we really hurt each other a lot. But what our sins do to each other is secondary to the real problem of sin. It's first and foremost a rebellion against God. See, we have waged war against God with our sin. We've told him that we don't need him. We, we have stolen his glory and his service. We have presumed upon his goodness to us despite the way that we treat him. Today we're going to see Jesus overcome these temptations so that he can be the savior that, 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 that unfit people like you and me need. So please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 4 verse 5. We're going to first look at the temptations that Jesus faced, these last two temptations, and, then, and we're going to look at how he dealt with them. And then we're going to see what happens when temptations return. 
And then lastly, what I want to do is take a little bit of time here at the end of the day uh, to talk about failure. What do we do when we fail? What do we do when we find ourselves mired in our own failure, in our own sin, when we fail to stand up to temptation? So pick it up with me uh, in chapter 4, verse 5. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The uh, devil takes Jesus up and shows him all the kingdoms of the earth in a moment of time. Now, this is a vision of some kind. Matthew talks about uh, Jesus being taken up to the top of a mountain. I believe that's where he goes and he has this vision. Of course, there's no mountain high enough in the world to see every nation of the earth. So he goes up onto this high place and he sees in a vision this, this moment of of, in this moment of time, all the nations of the earth, something that represents the nations of the earth. And the devil makes Jesus an offer. He says, all these kingdoms, all of them, have been given to me, and then he can turn around and give them to whoever he wants. The first question is, is that true? <laughs> you ever thought about that? I mean, he's offering something. Is that, is that true? Can he, can he really do that? Does the devil actually have the authority he claims to have here? Well, this is one of those half-truths that the devil loves to tell. The devil is, in fact, uh, been, he has been given some ability to, to rule. He's been given some space, some area to maneuver, to wreak havoc in the world. John chapter 12 uh, Jesus refers to Satan as the ruler of this world. So there is a sense in which Satan does have some ruling power. And you don't have to spend much time on this earth uh, to know that something is up with the management, right? I mean, you, you can look around and go, something is powerful, and something is powerful in the wrong kind of way. There's some sort of evil that's happening, and there's a lot of evil that's flowing and, and kind of going unchecked. And so when you look at that, you say, okay, yes, God is in control, but there's something that's happening. God has allowed for Satan to have some dominion, some influence on the world. Now, we could spend a lot of time talking about the extent of that dominion and how much that Satan is able to do, uh, but we really don't have time for that this morning. So suffice it to note that the half-truth here, the half part of this that he's saying that is true, is, is that Satan does have some room to maneuver. Okay, He does have some power. He can maneuver in our fallen world, and, and he has the authority to do that. But the half-lie is that he can give it away. This is, that's the part that's not true. He, he's posturing himself as one who has ultimate authority, and he can give it to whomever he likes. Now, it's either a lie or the devil himself is mistaken about his own authority. Either one of those things could be true. I'm not sure which one it is. But either way, the, the allowance God has made for the devil to operate in some ways within this world in no way gives the devil any authority to give the glory for that to other people, to give the authority for that to other people. My kids each have a room in our house. Let me be very specific. They each get to occupy a room in our house that Rachel and I own. Okay, They would call this room their room. They would say that. This is my room. And you know what? That's fine. I have no problem with that. They can decorate however they like in that room. Sammy's got a lot of sports going on. Allie's room is very dog-oriented. No problem. I don't have a problem with that. They, uh, they certainly have some authority to call the shots on what goes on in those rooms, but let's not get it twisted. If I show up someday and one of their friends is now living in the corner of that room, subletting some part of their room, there's going to be a conversation about that, right? We're going to have to have a talk. And first, the first thing I'm going to say to them, I'm going to let them know I am genuinely impressed with their entrepreneurial pursuit. <laughs> you know, I mean, to be a nine-year-old landlord, that is noteworthy. 
But second, and this is really the issue here, okay? This is the issue. They, they have no actual ownership of that space. There's no actual authority over the realm of their room. They've simply been permitted some secondary authority that is entirely dependent on our willingness to give them that authority. That's, that's the only authority that Satan has in this world, okay? Just expand that out to a, to, to a much bigger degree to go to all of the earth. That's the only authority he has. That's the only authority he's been given. He, he's been given some limited authority to act for a particular period of time. But the idea that Satan could bestow some of this authority and, and, and some, some of this glory to, to us, well, that's what's tempting about this sin. Do you want to be more in control? Let me ask you. Do you want to be more in control of your life? Do you want to be in charge of the world around you? Do you want everyone and everything in your life to revolve around you as you command them to do everything that pleases you? You ever get that feeling? All you have to do in order for that to happen is remove the authority of God from your life, and that authority then becomes yours. Now you're in charge. Jesus is being tempted with the authority of all of the nations. All he has to do is cast off, cast off this, this misplaced, burdensome authority from God, the Father. After all, the Spirit has driven him into the wilderness, and the Father hasn't provided any food. All Jesus has received for his devotion to the Father is, is 40 days of hunger. So why should Jesus stick to this arrangement? Why give God any glory at all for that situation? He, he let God control. He let the Father control everything that happened to him. He let the Spirit drive him where the Spirit wanted him to go, and this was the result. The devil's offer seems like maybe this is a good one. You can have authority over everything. You can have full reign and all the benefits of a world that revolves around you if you just come and worship me instead of God. This is the temptation. And let me tell you, sinners have bought this hard. We have bought this hard. We have swallowed this bait. Hook, line, and sinker. Now, I understand that most people who reject the gospel who do not follow Jesus, would not describe themselves as Satan worshipers. They wouldn't say, I am a worshiper of the devil. They wouldn't wouldn't put themselves in that category. Maybe some would, but most wouldn't. When we think of devil worshipers, we we tend to think of, you know, goth kids and Ouija boards and the exorcist, right? I have a friend who likes to do tarot card readings online, and he tells people about astrology. That's what we think of when we think of, of Satan worship, of devil worship. But look, All you have to do to worship Satan is not worship the Creator God. That's all you have to do. All you have to do is reject the one who has authority over this world. And suddenly you are worshiping something else. If you are guided by your own authority, if you are in pursuit of your own glory, you have accepted this deal from the devil, whether you realize it or not. As Paul wrote in Romans 1, 25, people who accept this deal exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. Jesus saw this temptation for what it is. He saw it as an issue of worship and service. If he, if he went after this deal to get glory and authority, he would actually be stealing worship from the Father. He'd be taking it away. Now, you might be thinking, but you know what? Kyle, this is Jesus. We're talking about Jesus here. Isn't he supposed to be worshipped? Doesn't he already have all the authority? Isn't he worthy of all the glory? Well, yes, that is all true. There is actually real irony in this offer because Satan is not all-knowing like God. He doesn't know what's going on here. He doesn't know the extent of who Jesus is. He he probably thinks this would be a very tempting thing for the Son of God. And you know why? Every other Son of God that came before Jesus accepted this offer to some degree. Every other person who's referred to as a Son of God, all the kings of Israel, all of them fell. 
all of them grabbed hold of something in the world and sought their own glory and sought their own worship. And so why wouldn't this son of God fall for it? They all became failures. Maybe this one will fail. Every one of us, every one of us who have sinned have accepted this deal. We are all sinners who at certain points of our lives sought our own glory by our own authority, turning away from God to go after those things that we wanted. We played right into Satan's scheme. But here, Jesus, the true Son of God, representing the humanity that has failed to worship and serve the Lord exclusively, acts in his spirit-empowered humanity when he quotes Deuteronomy 6. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. See, Jesus won't compromise his worship of the Lord or his service to the Lord. He will not go off mission to get something for himself. See, Satan comes to him and says, you know what? Worship me as a means to the end you want. Worship me, bow down to me, as a, and, and worship me as a, as a means to the end that you are trying to get. And Jesus says to him, worshiping the Lord is the end that I want. This is what I want. Glorifying the Lord is the end that I am after. Let's look at the third temptation. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on, on, on the pinnacle of a temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This last temptation is interesting in the way that the devil argues, because here he uses Scripture. Does that seem out of character? <laughs> Doesn't it seem odd that the devil would be like, well, let me, let me use some Scripture here. You know what's even more surprising about this? You'd think he'd get that Scripture wrong, wouldn't you? But he doesn't. He actually gets it right. He's not using it out of context. I know Christians that can't use the Bible out of context. The devil here uses the Bible in context. Listen to this section of Psalm 91 where he quotes. Listen to this section. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, on their hands you will bear, he will, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. This is a great psalm of God's protection. It's a poetic way of conveying the promise that when you have the Lord, nothing will ultimately hurt you. Yes, of course, believers will suffer in this life. But here's the promise. You won't experience anything outside of the Lord's control. God has you in the grip of his grace when you live for him. And he has you there for eternity. It's a very encouraging passage. So go ahead, Jesus. This is true. Go ahead, Jesus. You're the son of God. Throw yourself down from the temple. Put God's protective grace on display for all to see. Now, I think the devil doesn't know whether Jesus is the Son of God here. I, I think he, he probably doesn't know. I think he's hoping that this might trick Jesus into killing himself. And if God does, not, does come through for him, let's say he is who he claims to be. Let's say he is the perfect Son of God. Let's say there is something divine about this Jesus. Satan's not sure, but let's say something is. At least when he's saved, the devil will have begun the process of getting Jesus to listen to him to his words. Jesus will sin as, as long as he jumps. Whether he's saved or not by the Father, he'll be engaged in some kind of sin. It's actually a pretty sly strategy that he has here. And, and what makes it even more clever is that he does it by appealing to Scripture that says that God's people have nothing to fear. He's using Jesus' own Bible against him. So 
the question is, what exactly is the sin here? Well, what is he tempting him to do? Because the fact of the matter is, the father would have saved the son. I mean, the, 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 it was a, a whole mission. The father is, is going to raise Jesus from the dead here at the end of the three years of his ministry. The, the father absolutely loves Jesus. He would definitely save him. So why not then just demonstrate this right here in the ultimate display of Jesus' divine sonship? I mean, what, 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 what would this do to the devil? If, if he did this, it would send the ultimate fear into the devil's heart, right? Guess who I really am? Let me show you. Let me demonstrate this for you. Again, the real temptation here is clear from Jesus' answer. See, Jesus answers the devil on this temptation in a way that shows us what the devil was actually trying to get him to do as far as sin. He quotes Deuteronomy 6 again. He says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Moses is speaking to the children of the generation that complained in the wilderness. Basically, this is, these are the children that are about to enter into the promised land here in Deuteronomy 6. And he's speaking to them about their their parents, basically. And this new nation is, is about to go in, and Moses says, don't be like your parents who tested the Lord at Massa. Massa was a, a place where the people complained that they didn't have enough water to drink. So they were wandering through the desert. They began to complain to Moses, hey, how come we don't have enough water? Where's the water that we're supposed to drink? The, the water, not having enough water, was supposed to give them... Uh, uh, an opportunity to put their trust in the Lord, but instead of trusting the Lord to provide, they went to Moses and they just whined to him. Why'd you bring us out here to die? How come God hasn't come through for us? Why hasn't he provided the thing we need? Instead, instead of driving them to the Lord in trust, it made them test God. Essentially, they said, Moses, if God is really God, he better give us water. And so God gave them the water. But the place was named Masa, which means quarreling. I don't know what it would have been named if they had just trusted that the Lord would provide water, but it was named Masa because they were all quarreling. They were fighting. They were demanding of God. The temptation here is to take a heart attitude of demanding something from the Lord to see if he really is who he says he is. And it's been 40 days for you, Jesus. This is what the Satan comes along. Forty days. No manna. You haven't received anything. You won't make bread yourself because God is supposed to provide. Why don't you, why don't you make him prove it? Why don't you make him prove it? Why don't you force God's hand and make him display his goodness for you? In effect, the, the challenge to Jesus is to control the Father. Why don't you control him? Why don't you make him do your bidding. Force him to perform and be the sort of God that, that you want him to be. Now the sin is coming into view, isn't it? Are you starting to see it a little bit? You've probably never thrown yourself down from a high tower in order to try to get something from God. If you, if you had, you probably wouldn't be watching this video right now. But I'm sure that at some point in your life, you have had the thought, God, if you are really powerful, if you're really powerful, if you really love me, if you really are the gracious God that you say you are, then you'd better do this for me. I know I've had that thought. I mean, you probably have too. This is another subtle sin because there's a difference, but not always a clear line between trusting in God's promises and demanding God to provide what you want based on his promises. Ever find yourself bargaining with God? God, if you do this for me, I will do this for you. Oh, God, I did this thing. Now you have to provide for me. You ever, ever found yourself there? God, Jesus said that, that you like to give good gifts to your children. So where are my good gifts? I'm waiting for my good gifts, God. God, you said to, to pray for healing. So I did pray for healing, and you didn't heal. Where's my healing? Where's your goodness to me? How come, you didn't, how come you didn't do the thing I said? See, when we do this, what we're saying to the Lord is, I'm not here to serve your purposes. You're here to serve my purposes. 
We flip this whole relationship around. We're commanding God. It's an attempt, really, to bring God under our rule. Non-believers love to make arguments like, like Satan makes, makes here. If, if your God is so great, why is there all this evil in the world? I'm sure you've heard that before, right? If, if, if your God is so great, then why fill in the blank with whatever you think ought to really be happening? And if that thing were happening, I don't, I don't know, you probably just change the argument to something else at that point. But basically, the argument from a lot of non-believers is, why don't you just display your power in the way I think you ought to display your power? When your heart moves you in this direction, when you start to think along these lines, and this is kind of the direction your heart is going, what you've really done is put yourself into God's place. You're no longer looking to God for guidance. You're telling God what to do with an attitude of superiority over him. For non-believers, this is, is mocking God. For believers, this is presuming on God. And for both, it's an affront to God. Because God's not controlled by anyone. Jesus passes the test by not putting the Lord to the test. In fact, Jesus successfully overcomes all three of these subtle, distinct attacks from the devil to to attempt him to break his relationship with the Father. He will not give himself something that the Lord has not provided him. He will not take the glory and the worship that is due only to the Lord. He will not demand the Lord display his power for his own benefit. Or if I turn that around and I put that positively, in successfully responding to these temptations, Jesus affirms that the Lord can be trusted to provide. He is worthy of all of our praise, and he is sovereign over all of his creation, including us. So that did it. Jesus succeeded in every way that we failed. So that would have to be the end of temptation, right? And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Until an opportune time, 40 days, he conquered. He he got done with all of this. You mean he's going to have to try to do this again? He absolutely is. I think we all know that temptation is not one of, a one-time event. Victory uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit is temporary, this side of Jesus' return. Someday, when, when Jesus returns and we're all transformed into final glorification, when, we know, when the sin is gone, it's been thrown into the lake of fire, there's no, no more suffering, no more sin, there will be no more temptation to sin. But we know right now, temptation is going to return. Satan is going to continue to use tactics to get at you. First Peter describes the activity of Satan like a lion prowling around looking for someone to devour. Just because you chased off the lion and you succeeded doesn't mean the lion isn't going to come back. Even Jesus is going to see attempts from Satan again to try to trip him up. I wish I could tell you that once you walk with Jesus long enough, you're going to stop facing temptation. I really wish I could tell you that. It is true that as you grow in Christ, you'll, you'll be more and more uh, like him, and you're going to see more and more victory, and God is going to slowly weed the sins out of your life. That is definitely true. And it's also true that as you grow to become more like Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in you, many of the sins that entangled you earlier in your life will start to become repulsive to you. You're going to start to want to get away. Those things won't be as tempting as they used to be. The closer you walk with Jesus, the more your mind is is shaped by the Word of God. And and then it becomes less inclined uh, to be tempted to those things that pull you away from Jesus that actually contradict God's word because you've started to find your joy in God, not in the things that, that go against the Lord. You start to see the lies that somehow sin is going to give you more joy than God himself is going to give you. You will grow in that. But understand Satan is not done with you. His plan for this world 
where he has some reign, some space to maneuver, includes trying to trip you up. He's going to work to get you off of Jesus' mission. He's going to try to get your eyes onto something else, onto some other mission that will serve his plans. He might be able to capture your heart and capture your soul because you're trusting in Jesus, but he can get you off target. You don't, you don't need to be a Satan worshiper to be ineffective for the Lord. See, you'll be serving the devil's purposes if you just spend your life providing for your own self, giving yourself your own bread, serving your own kingdom, using your faith for your own purposes. And the temptation to do these things is coming this week. I hate to tell you this. It's coming this week. And here's the thing. It's going to come at an opportune time. So what about when we fail? What do I, let's talk about failure. We just watched Jesus succeed. What about us? What about when we fail? Part of the danger of watching Jesus prepare so well for ministry and seeing him conquer those temptations uh, is that we start to think that God's message to us is probably just do better. You know, we look at Jesus, we see him conquer temptation. We, is the message to us do better? We could read a passage like this as if God is saying to us, do you see Jesus? Do you see how well he did it? Aren't you going to do a better job? Aren't you going to fight like he fought? We could begin to think that God is only pleased with us if we succeed like Jesus, and he rejects us if we fail to live up to the standard that Jesus set for us. So what happens this week when we don't score 100% on the test? I mean, I, I, I got a good feeling based on the track record of the last 42 years that I'm probably not going to land an A-plus this week on all of the temptations that are going to come my way. You know, and then something like, then something like a Robbie Zacharias situation happens. And, 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 some, and, and, you know, a famous Christian that people trusted and looked to as an example of righteousness gets exposed as the horrific secret sinner that he clearly was. And when that happens, then the question really shifts. It really shifts. If that guy, if that guy who seemingly followed Jesus so closely and knew the word better than I know the word and studied it more faithfully, if he had as much sin in his life as he did, what, of me, what about me? What hope is there for me? Church, while I want to challenge you today to walk in step with the Spirit, Drawing on God's power, drawing on the, on the spirit and, and, and focusing on God's word to combat the temptations you face. Well, I want to challenge you in that direction because Jesus very clearly sets the example for us, calls us to come follow him, follow in his footsteps, combat temptation as we are called to do. I want to challenge you with that, but at the same time, it would be a tragedy if you walked away thinking that you just need to do better. It is so important for you to see that what Jesus did there in the wilderness, he did for you. He did it on your behalf. It is not just an example to follow. It's obedience to replace your disobedience. By remaining free of sin, Jesus made himself the man who could sympathize with our affliction and provide for us the righteousness that we could never achieve on our own. He succeeds precisely where we fail, so that at the cross, he could take our failure and ascribe to us his success. So when you put your trust in Jesus, what you are saying is, Lord, please accept me into your presence. Let me come before you, Father. Let me be confident to come into your presence, not on the basis of my own victory over sin, but on the basis of Jesus' victory over sin on my behalf. Listen to these words from Hebrews chapter 4. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted 
as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He did this for you. He went into the wilderness and overcame temptation that you and I face. He won the battle that we could not win. He came to secure survival for the unfit. If you have Jesus and you're, you're still picturing an angry God on the edge of throwing you out, if that's how you see God, yeah, I'm doing my best, but I feel like God is just on the, I'm just right on the verge. I'm near the, 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 the borderline of his kingdom, and he's just about to kick me out of here because you're failing to stand up to temptation. If that's the way you see God, you've got Jesus all wrong. You completely misunderstand grace. Dane Ortland wrote a book very recently. It's a very good book. And in this book, he says, he sighs. He's talking about Jesus. He sides with you against your sin, not against you because of your sin. That's Jesus' heart for you. He went into that wilderness, and he took on that temptation, and he maintained his perfect life so that he could take your sin, so that the temptations you face this week can be overcome by the Spirit he's given you. So keep up that two-fisted fight against sin. But when you fail, cling to him. Cling to Jesus. When you fail, repent and remember his grace. With confidence, draw near to the throne of God's grace because Jesus is your victory. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you for this incredible gift of a Savior who stood up to the temptations that I fail to stand up to. Thank you, Lord, that you have given me grace because Jesus is strong precisely where I am weak. He is a victor precisely where I am a failure. And help us, Lord, to cling to that grace as we overcome and follow hard in Jesus' footsteps. Give us this week a, 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 a dose of your spirit. Fill us, Lord, with our, a, a deep desire to walk in righteousness and obedience because what Jesus has done for us through his cross. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand and let's worship together again. What gifts of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to his oh how strange and divine i can sing all is mine yet not i but through christ in me the night is dark but I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior, He will stay I labor on In weakness and rejoicing For in my need His power is displayed To this I hold My shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead Oh, the night has been won And I shall overcome Yet not I, but through Christ in me No fate 
I dread I know I am forgiven The future sure The price it has been paid For Jesus bled And suffered for my pardon And he was raised To overthrow the grave To this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea Oh, the chains are released I can sing I am free Yet not I, but through Christ in me With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for He has said that He will bring me home. And day by day, I know He will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. As I hold my hope is only Jesus All the glory evermore to Him When the race is complete Still my lips shall repeat Yet not I, but through Christ in me To this I hold My hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Amen. Though we fail, God is faithful because Jesus overcame the temptation and gave his status to us. Be encouraged in that this week. Have a wonderful week.